Hey, I've got a tip for you. Don't walk in a rainforest when it's raining if you don't want to get wet. <laughs> but let me tell you, it was worth it coming up here. This view is absolutely tremendous. And I don't know if you've ever done what I've done. I love to do on waterfalls that, you know, you start at the top and pick out a droplet of water and follow it all the way down. Because that's really what a waterfall is, is all those individual droplets on a waterfall this big. But it's spectacular. It's an amazing creation of God. Pompeii is filled with waterfalls everywhere. And it just, like I say, it reminds me directly from the hand of the Creator. Yeah, you know, it's been uh, destroyed really by thousands of years of sin, but it still remains enough to give us a visual indication of the Creator God. Well, it just came under from the wet to the dry. You know, there's a huge overhang with a cave I want you to check out in a moment, but I mean, it's wonderful. I, I'm soaking wet, I'm filthy dirty now, but this is what you come out here for. This is the fun. This is the, the exploration to see the beauty, to see everything of God's creation. You can hear the waterfall just right off to the side of us cascading over the cave. So now it's time to check out the cave. You know, this is exciting up here, but I would have never found my way up here. Well, you know, maybe after some time, but they may have found my body. <laughs> but my buddy here, Mr. B, he's my guide, and he's got a lot of good stories because as a, a child, you came up here. Tell me what, you, you were sharing something about honeybees or something. Yeah, we used to come during a time I was in elementary, like 1960s. We come up here and we hive all over under, and we have to use the stick to poke. How did you get a stick that tall? Those are really tall. Oh no, they are low. That side is no, very low. Very low. Yeah, so we have to go up and poke, uh, you know, the lower ones. Yeah. When they fell, these honeybees, they are all over us. <laughs> then sing Stinging us. Singing. Uh, sometimes we, our eyes are so swollen, we cannot see. <laughs> so my question is, why did you do that? It's just fun and uh, we like the taste of, uh, you know, the, the honey. honey. Oh, right. Yeah, and just making fun of each other. I want you to know, I, I like him as a brother. I've got my arm around him, but I've also got my arm around him so he doesn't fall off the cliff. <laughs> so tell me another story. What about these caves? There's a lot of lore involved. Uh, you know, when I first came up here, you cannot see rocks here. It's covered by, you know, the waste from the bats and the swift lift. It's all over here. So we go inside there and we just slide down in the... In the bat going up. Yeah, oh. in the corner. <laughs> so now people found out that it's really good for fertilizer. It's all gone. It's just clean up, nothing. It's only a little bit left. So yeah. you're not going to be tempted today to slide down anywhere? No, it's all rocks, you know. We cannot do that anymore. <laughs> oh man, I'm getting to know you better all the time. You know? <laughs> do you have any other stories that you haven't told us about the caves? You've always got a great story. That's it, you're out of story? Well, uh, no. there is a place that said, um, just like a Don't go away of, from me too far, you scared file me. of rocks. <laughs> and uh, people believe that when you come up here, you have to bring branches of trees or leaves, bushes, and leave it on that uh, file of rocks. I'll have to go over there because yeah. I got it all over my clothes yeah. so I can leave it up. <laughs> so that uh, you don't get accident here. They okay. believe that the ghost or the spirits will protect you when you are here if you do that. Okay. All right. And I think today we forgot. <laughs> That's okay. We've got the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amen. Well, yeah. hey, I appreciate it. We got to check out the caves yeah. now. So all this is all bat guano. Yeah. Everywhere. It's all over. Here, it's just little. Before in 1960s and 70s, you cannot see rocks. I know it's a lot more up there because I can smell it. It's strong. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was going to stay 
up in the cave for a little bit, explored a little more, but it is way too strong for me. I'm coming back a little ways. <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful. It's a nice place where uh, people come for a picnic or, you know, they come just to relax. Uh, picnic, doing... boy, the Pompeians are, yeah. are strong because that's quite a journey. Yeah, they come here. But uh, whenever they come here, they have to, uh, you know, they believe that uh, you have to bring leave or things, something to offer to the spirits here. Okay. So that you will have good luck here. There so you be no. So you grab the leaf. Yeah. You're gonna show us how it's done. Leaves and see people who came before us. They have all these pile of leaves there. And, and what spirit is this supposed to be to? Uh, I will, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, you know they say the spirit here will protect you while you are here. So they just kind of cover their beds, hedge their beds. Yeah. So, they don't know if it works or not. Uh, no. But I know you and I have talked. We uh, serve, we serve the God of Heaven. Yeah. Many times I came here, I don't. <laughs> print these things, so you know, this is just a belief yeah. that the people here have. How, how much time did you spend here, do you think, over the years? Um, not really many. Whenever tourists or you know, some of the student missionaries would like to come up here, I bring them up bring here. Bring the student missionaries. So maybe once a year, maybe in a year, maybe I come up here maybe three, four times. Three, four times? Oh, that's quite a bit. Yeah. All right. This, I noticed this too. This is beautiful over here, the waterfall. Yeah, it's a little bit small. Sometimes it's really big when it's raining. The waterfall will be <laughs> really pouring down there. I had to stop here for a moment and just give you an idea of the, the grandeur of this location. It is massive. It's stunning. Absolutely beautiful. And then I think about the size and I feel like a, almost an ant against these massive cliffs. I think about the Lord, Isaiah says, I sit on the circle of the earth. Everybody's like grasshoppers to me. You know, God is so awesome, so wonderful. And to think he came down here to planet earth, to talk with us, to walk among us. Is this amazing? Yes, it is. God is more amazing. We've got so much more for you. I invite you to stay tuned because we'll be right back. The three biggest killers in the islands of Micronesia are heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. Canvasback has tackled these issues head-on by establishing a wellness center on the atoll of Majuro. People there eat very few vegetables. Now, thanks to Canvasback, islanders are learning how to grow gardens in their backyards and to exercise. The lifestyle changes have been so remarkable the government invited Canvas back to write an entire curriculum for the public school system. Now the lives of the children are changing too. And our trained neighborhood health teams travel the island to monitor glucose levels, heart rate, and blood pressure. It's not uncommon to discover glucose levels of five to 600. These people are taken to the hospital and once stabilized, the team begins the education process to reverse their diabetes. That's right reverse their diabetes. Many island nations are asking us to come over and help them. With your financial help, many more islanders can experience good health. So tell me, doctor, we're in what room right now? We, we had a hard place in the hospital finding a place where we wouldn't be totally obtrusive. <laughs> That's right, we're in the area where all the instruments are autoclaved and uh, some instruments are stored, as you can see here. And um, we have tabletop autoclaves that we use for ophthalmology because our instruments are small. So we have two different sizes, uh, a kind of a medium and a large that have larger cassettes that, where the, the cooking of the instruments occurs. And uh, as we're talking here, you'll hear occasionally a little Yeah, what sound. is that sound for our viewers? It's gonna drive yeah. them crazy probably, but uh, we'll focus on you. Right, but that's a, a sound that it makes has, having to do with uh, just like in a pressure cooker, it's maintaining a certain pressure as the uh, instruments are being cooked. And then once the cycle's done, then it starts venting off gas, which is another interesting sound you may hear as we go along. Okay. Can, can I assume that your team brought all of these instruments? No, these are instruments these are. that the hospital 
has, and they are uh, generally much larger and you know for all, all different types of cases that they might do. Okay. There's uh, general surgeons here, and um, we've already witnessed them doing some amputations. We've also witnessed a uh, C-section uh, birth. Uh, you know, not well, I mean through the window. We, yeah. We, we yeah. didn't assist with it, but. So there, everything there are other normal cases going on here. Everything you bring is more specialized, a lot smaller, typically. That's right. We have uh, uh, instruments that are generally small enough that it's hard to tell what they are w without putting them under the microscope. Okay. Um, and uh, so an entire tray would be about, you know, a little bit bigger than my hand of say 10 or so instruments that we would use for a routine case and then we have our accessory instruments either in other trays or in sterile bags that can be opened as needed. Now I know you've got a real heart for canvas back. You've been a driving force recruiting and bringing people together to participate in these teams. Tell me a little more about that. Well I first went I believe it was in 2002 on an ophthalmology trip and I enjoyed it enough that I went a few more times and uh, it turned out that until this trip they were all uh, at one of the locations that we go to in the Marshall Islands but I believe this is my fifth or sixth trip uh, that I've made and uh, it evolved into me um, you know directing it medically and getting the doctors together and the, and the team members which is really a lot of fun because when you tell them we're going to go help people and we're going to do this kind of work and we're going to go you know to an interesting place uh, then they're usually saying, oh, I'd really like to go, let me check my calendar. Um, and sometimes there's problems with that, but, but uh, I don't usually have to ask too many people before we get a team together. For this particular team, how long did it actually take you to recruit the team? I'd say it came together over maybe a two-month period, something like that. So pretty rapidly, really. Yes. Yeah, some, there, every once in a while there's a key position where I have to ask more people to make it work out. Okay. Now, Tell us what type of people are needed on these kind of teams. Well, uh, certainly for an ophthalmology team, we need people with special skills. Um, so uh, besides surgeons, we need assistants who, who are used to doing that kind of work so that we can be efficient. And um, so it's a special skill set. Um, we have a pool of people who say, uh, I'd really like to help, but I've never worked with eyes before. And those people can come and can be of help, and we can train them in. But we can't go only on those kind of people. We need people, uh, as I said, who have the special skill set. And so I'm specifically looking for those people. Okay. Tell me a little bit more why you have such a heart for Canvas Back. Well, I just, I, I enjoy uh, helping people. That's why I became a doctor in the first place. And um, then there's a further enjoyment from uh, doing it for as a volunteer to uh, help people who especially don't may not have access to the, the care. Nobody gets paid for this. That's right. It's a, it's a volunteer thing. So uh, that's a special joy. So when you when when I go on a vacation, that's enjoyable. But it's even more enjoyable to spend vacation time doing something that's helping people. And we usually have a day or so where we can. Uh, we enjoy the area we're in, do an excursion or something, that's fun too. Um, but uh, the biggest fun is, is seeing, uh, working with the people, seeing the smiles on their faces, and uh, uh, knowing that we've made an impact in their lives. We saw, we were watching some post-op removing the bandages. These people who couldn't see, apparently hardly the hand in front of the face, all of a sudden can now see it. Right. That's, that's got to be rewarding. Right, and, and uh, we don't always get to see that here, but but uh, when we operate just before the weekend, then we get to go in on the weekend and see some of that, uh, which I was able to do a couple days ago. And uh, that's, that's the, probably the most fun of the trip for me. Get to see the fruits of your labor. Right, because the, the doctors who are in the clinic all the time, they see it pretty much every day. And, and uh, that's, that is a real, probably one of the more really fun parts is to see those smiles. Um, and, but I get to see them uh, on that one day. And then sometimes as, I, as we come in and do their second eye, um, that's often possible to do on the trip that we get to see them. Why do you do one eye at a time? Oh, well, there's, there are some risks with surgery. Um, and one risk is that they could have an infection in their eye, which can be devastating. Um, usually if we catch it, we can reverse it, but it could be devastating. It even leads to loss of the eye or loss of vision or loss of the eye itself. And so um, this is a reason probably not to do both eyes at once. Although to be honest, it is increasing in its frequency around the world and how it's being done. 
but um, I would say probably not the best for a uh, mission situation. Um, and so that's why we steer clear of it. Another thing you can think of is that we're putting an implant lens in. It's based on a calculation, and that calculation could be off to the left or to the right. That is nearsighted or farsighted. And if you do the second eye at a different time, then you can change the lens implant for that eye to try to make the outcome be even more precise okay. if possible. Rabudi was born blind. That's right, he couldn't see at all. The entire family were his caregivers. Their lives were completely tied to the needs of their little son. The doctors at the hospital lacked the experience to provide him with surgical help. This situation continued for six long years. Making less than $100 per month, there was no way to ever afford the surgery. Even if they could fly off island, the surgery in another country could be $12,000. It looked like all hope was gone. Enter the Canvasback Super Team. Rabuti was examined and the surgery was performed. The day the bandages came off, he saw his parents and siblings for the very first time. He and the family were set free. There are more children like Rabuti who are in desperate need. You can change many lives. Please give sight to the blind. Log on to canvasback.org today to give your gift of love. Dr. Chin, I heard him say this morning in, in our meeting, I believe it was what, that the, the greatest cause of blindness is glaucoma? Well, he said cataracts. Cataracts, excuse me, yeah, worldwide. cataracts, yes. Yeah, there's estimated to be about 20 to 30 million people worldwide who uh, are blind in both eyes from cataracts. And this is an estimated number, it's hard to really pin it down. Um, many of them are in the areas of the world that you would expect that are the poorest and have the, the least access to health care. Um, I have a colleague who's been to Ethiopia where there's probably over a million of those patients are in that country where there are approximately, I think, four ophthalmologists per million residents or maybe somewhere around there. And some of the areas are quite rural and so uh, the more uh, remote the place is, the more likely there are to be patients that are uh, underserved by okay. health resources like that. The Canvas Back is always in need of volunteers. Many volunteers are going all the time, not just uh, uh, eye, but uh, orthopedic and gynecology and ear, nose, and throat specialist, and the list kind of goes on. What would you say to, to folks of why they're needed? It, all their expertise or non-expertise, assistance, whatever. Why are they needed? Well, they're, they're needed because um, you can't, you need many hands to make light work. And that's the way I would say it. So we, we need uh, people to come. We need their enthusiasm. We need their, uh, but we need their, their hands, you know, to, to do the work that needs to be done. And, um, at every phase of, of the trip, uh, there's, there's supplies to be dealt with, there's patients to be dealt with. Um, sometimes when children of, of the workers come along, we use them as runners to communicate back and forth, pass notes or, or, or walk patients back and forth between the clinic and the operating room area. So um, we try to get everybody involved. And if, if uh, w when we have a smaller trip and fewer people, then we, uh, there's so many, uh, so much more exhausting because you can't, when you try to do everything yourself, then you can't take care of as many patients. Now, I've heard this before is, well, why don't you just stay in the United States? Because there's lots of need right there. Why travel halfway across the world? Well, there, there, uh, I would not deny that there are needs in the United States. I would just say that the, it seems like there are greater needs than other countries. Um, and the, there, are, uh, there are patients in the United States who do not have insurance and I have been involved personally in helping some of those patients to get cataract surgery that they need. And it's, that's very rewarding also, believe me. And, and we get some wonderful thank you notes from patients who um, we were able to help them get care that otherwise they couldn't have gotten. So we, so we have that everyday mission that we do back home. Um, but I would say that the absolute numbers of those patients are pretty low compared to some other places in the world. Okay. The, the uh, 
financial numbers for Canvas back, it, it, it costs money to bring a team here, but the amount of money that comes out of it as far as the, uh, well, basically the, the uh, amount of money that's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's about a million dollars worth of procedures and things that are done totally free for the people. Why would you say, and I, I know you're a, a supporter of the ministry financially also, why would you say that people should support Canvas Bank? Well, um, my answer would be that the, um, that when you're, the money that you give has a uh, kind of a tangible result, and that's something a lot of, when I'm, when I'm a donor, I love to see that. You know, you get to see, you know that you're helping people see better or get care that they otherwise couldn't get. And so that's, uh, it's very rewarding, and it's uh, something tangible that you can see. And I believe it's pretty efficient financially. In other words, for, the, for an amount of money, um, some organizations, I don't know what Canvas Back number is, they actually have a number of dollars per eye that sees better. And um, this is a calculation that can be done, but it's something that, that just goes to show how your, your dollars can get a, a, a tangible result and that um, help to uh, help people to see kind of the love of Christ in action, you know. Amen. And I think that's Amen. a neat thing. It's called trigger finger. The fingers of the hand lock into position like pulling a trigger. This can be a problem for a teacher who needs to be on the computer all the time. Rosalinda even saved her money and went off island two different times to visit doctors in other countries. No relief, four long years and no answers. But then the Canvasback Orthopedic Super Team arrived on the island. They did the needed surgery on both hands. In just a short time, she was as good as new. This is just one of the thousands of stories of lives that have been drastically changed by Canvasback missions. Because of the lack of certain medical specialties, people sometimes suffer for decades with no relief. But you can change all of that. Your gifts to Canvasback can help stop their suffering. Simply log on to canvasback.org. Our Canvasback volunteers are bringing hope to those who have no hope. They are providing healing to those who are in need. Every volunteer takes time from their busy schedules to help others for no pay at all. That's right, our help is virtually free of charge. Surgeries that could cost thousands of dollars are performed for no pay. We do it because we love to see the smile on a person who was once blind and can now see. As the Bible says, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. I have the wonderful opportunity to see God's miracles of healing on a regular basis. If you would like to join us in bringing healing to those less fortunate, please partner with us. I guarantee you that you will be changing lives. Thank you in advance. To be a part of this exciting ministry, write us at Canvasback Missions, 940 Adams Street, Suite R, Benicia, California, 94510. You can also log on to canvasback.org or call us at 707-746-7828. Thank you for watching. Please join us again for another exciting island adventure. Remember, Canvasback is making an impact on hearts and lives one miracle at a time.